Okay, so I'm coming from Sukuba. Good afternoon, everybody. And Sukuba is 60 kilometer north of Tokyo. If you if you happen to be in Japan or near around, please give me an email, and you can visit me. And it takes just uh, one hour by train if you come from <coughs> Tokyo to Sukuba. You can visit our lab, and you can see world's largest magnet and uh, state-of-the-art laboratories. And um, believe me, it's a it's a worth visiting there. So you are all welcome to come to our lab. And uh, um, I will talk about basically two points. One is uh, you have here quantum mechanics, which is um, a very typical subject to understand because um, there are many things which is uh, very hard to believe and uh, and it gives uh, some kind of output which you which you can observe sometime but you cannot explain properly for an example if i ask i have a barrier of 4 volt and i have a particle of energy 1 volt and it can tunnel through without getting more energy which is which is completely unbelievable for 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 a normal person i mean it's it's just impossible but these kind of things happen and we use this kind of phenomenon so if you go through every every page of the quantum mechanics textbook and if you try to feel it you will find it's 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 unbelievable but okay true so this is the world where where impossibles happen and People are trying to trying to couple quantum mechanics with with biology. The the reason being that that nature has created biological stuffs so intelligent, so remarkable in performing that it is it is uh, quite impossible for the for the linear algorithms to explain. Linear algorithm means for say for an example computer. Few days back, I was reading uh, literature, and I, I, I found that um, honeybees solve um, a traveling salesman problem, one of the co most complicated problem to solve for con for the computer. So, traveling salesman problem is something like if I have five chairs and I want to go one chair, the second, second to the third, third to the fourth, fourth to the five, and come back to the one, then what is, should be the minimum path? So, if somebody asks me, I can, of course, I can tell. Oh, okay, I will go like this, 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 this. So B is perhaps I've done in this way. But if you ask a computer for 20 or 30 places how to go and come back to the first point, oh my God, it will be hell of a job for him. And uh, it may take more than the age of this universe to, to finish this kind, that kind of work. So, so, it's a, so it's many decisions, many things that we do every moment, you can't explain with the linear set of logic. You need to you need to come up with some some formulation where incredible things happen. That's why perhaps I don't know because I was not alive that time. <laughs> I don't I don't have that much experience of Jiri or, or Stuart. Perhaps that could be the reason they they brought quantum mechanics into into the into play and they try to do it. But the problem is if you look at the quantum machines around you or if you go through the literatures, you will find they all deal in the millikelvin temperature range or at a very, very low temperature. But biological systems, they work 300 Kelvin, that is the room temperature. So if somebody talks about quantum entanglement, quantum state, superposition of state, and other this kind of stuffs, other people start, okay, he's a crazy guy. He can't, I mean, he is abnormal or something, something like that. This kind of comment often come. So, so this kind of, I mean, this, uh, this is not, I mean, the situations are changing slowly and slowly as experimental results are supporting the fact that quantum systems or quantum mechanical systems can coexist with the classical world. There are several examples where experimental results are supporting the fact and slowly and slowly, those people who were once considered as, as some, people, some crazy, they are regarded as pioneers, as stars, as great thinkers, and something, something. In near future, maybe in five or ten, ten years, they will come to the mainstream. And they are already getting that honor. So how can a biological system um, holding the key of 
quantum mechanical properties can operate in room temperature? How come they can coexist? So I will try to put some light on that particular point. And another thing is that microtubule, which is uh, today's, I think, um, uh, major point of focus. So microtubule is, is, a, is, a, is a polymer, three con concentric layers. I will show you the, the picture right now. Now what happens is that microtubule changes very characteristic way its length. It grows and shrink, grows and shrink continuously in our living cell. Sometimes if necessary it remains, remains at a particular fixed length. Sometimes if necessary it grows on in a linear fashion. But it, it behaves in a very characteristic way. So if it is possible that we can understand exact information encoded in the microtubule, then we will be able to understand what are the communication process, what are the language of the cell. Then we can talk to a cell, a living cell. And that will help us to not only to understand or develop a future medica medication and uh, alternative medication, we will be able to, able to unearth the mystery that is around us in nature, in every biological species and, and systems. So this is also another point of, uh, of the research work. So first, I will talk about frolic condensation. So frolic condensation, one of the pioneers is, um, is here, with the G. Pokorni. And, uh, and I will try, try to look at it in a completely different perspective, not theoretically. If uh, somebody gives me some tools and ask me, can you realize frolic condensation in, in, a, in, a desktop, in a desktop table? So how do I do that? Can I, can I, can I do some device, any experiment to realize it? So let's, so I have just said that uh, microtubule behaves in a, in a typical fashion. So I did some measurement um, on, on the report, reported um, images or videograph, videographs taken from the internet, how microtubule length changes. And I have found that the behavior of length change is quite complex. Maybe, maybe there is a hunch that uh, some complex information processing going on. But the problem is that what one particular length of a microtubule, what information is there? How is it different from another length, one microtubule to another microtubule? Why it is doing this? So these kind of questions has to be answered. And once we know for an example, one microtubule is changing the length like this, like A, like B. You will find if you closely watch the videos, you will find after some time they behave in a hazy pattern. And then some characteristic feature of the B overlaps on A, and some characteristic feature of A overlaps on B. So I have gone through, nearly three years back, I have gone through several videos available, how microtubule changes its length in, in real physical system. And I have come to the conclusion that definitely there is something going on. What? I don't know. But definitely something is going on. And if we can understand, we can, we can model it with cellular automaton or different, different manners. So what is uh, microtubule? So microtubule has three concentric layers. The top layers you will have c -termini. It is called, it's an ionic channel. And, uh, and it's quite slow. Slow means hard or kilohertz range. If you go to the tubulin layers, then you can find the protein layers are there. And information can transport to that in the megahertz range. And you, if you go to the inner core, there is water channel, they can oscillate. And it will be, it could be possible that it is in the gigahertz range. So if you, if you just think about it, that C termini is connected to the tubulins, and all three, three, three structures are, are nearly, nearly ordered structures. So they have a symmetry transition here, and there is also a symmetry transition between water and the tubulin. That is a protein. If you just think of information processing terms, then you will find that, that there is a very complex interaction as far as different frequency range is concerned. So apparently, this is a very simple system but it is not that simple. There may be many things hidden in it. So we, I have, I have an intention that uh, I would like to unearth whatever the mystery is associated with microtubules. But currently, there is no experimental setup by which you can, at the same time, 
measure all kinds of interaction, energy interaction that is going on inside a microtubule. So at the beginning of this year, uh, I have invested nearly 1.3 million US dollar just to devise an instrument where photon, infrared, microwave, and all these kinds of interactions will go on. And at the same time, you can measure from 2.7 Kelvin to the room temperature, from ultra high vacuum to the normal atmosphere. And, and all this interaction, all the sensors will be in the, in the same position. So we, even before I just came here from Japan, I had the meeting with the engineers, and they have they have said that almost all the problems associated to that machine, because last three years I'm working on that machine building. And um, next February end, we will be able to commission this kind of instrument. So till then, the result that we have is only one set of frequency, one kind of frequency we, we have supply, and we characterize based on only on that frequency range, the output. Suppose I send a signal, say microwave, to the microtubule and ask him what is your response. So if it gives only in the microwave region, I detect it. But if there is a photon coming out of it in a complex manner, or some biophoton, what is called, or, or something else, I cannot tell because that is not possible. So whatever the result you will see is a, is a very, very specific vision. But, but in, this is the way normally characterization is done in different part of the world. So if you want to um, learn more about what kind of research work we do, you can just visit our website. Now, Frolic condensation. So Frolic condensation, if you just uh, think of it, it is, there was a time when chemists used to say that they can explain the origin of life, how the first life form came about, how the first molecule or the first complex structure where from the life originated came about. But there was a, there was a growing debate and that debate, the first person who contributed that Apart from the chemical, there could be electromagnetic wave that, have, that played a fundamental role in bringing up the first life form or, or the necessary architecture that led to the life form. And the, and the proposal was something like that. If you, if you, if you have, a, have a heat bath or, or something like this, where heat exchange is not allow, allowed, and then if you have some dipoles that can oscillate or vibrate, and if you have some electric constraint, electric field constraint, if you put them and you have uh, supply some electromagnetic energy at a particular frequency, a particular energy, you will find that they will all assemble together and form a, form a giant ar architecture. So this is quite incredible and this is apparently a fantastic proposal. And if you can do this on a, on a desktop, it, will be, it, is, it is marvelous to see. And we did that actually. So this is, um, a schematic, schematic view overview of, uh, but, the, but the setup is not very complex. If you want, you can do it in your laboratories also, small school laboratories, it's possible to do. So you have blue is um, negative, red is positive, say we have electrodes coming out in a, in a, in a heat bath that we, um, water bath, say 37 degrees Celsius, and we apply just AC signal and uh, microtubule grows spontaneously and falls down. So we, st we started from very low frequency to the very high frequency region. And we measure the length of the microtubule that we get. And we find that as frequency increases, as we come to the megahertz, if you are if at the very low frequency range, of course you get something. But as soon as you come to the megahertz range, the whole scenario goes on changing. You increase the frequency and you find slowly and slowly larger and larger microtubules. So initially, suppose a few kilohertz signal you apply, you will get microtubule of the length few hundred nanometers, say 200 nanometers. It's a very small length. But if you go towards 3.77 megahertz or around that signal, you will find that within two or three seconds, giant microtubules, say 22.5 micrometer long microtubules, they are created and fall all over the surface. So it's a beautiful experiment, I believe, a simple, very simple and beautiful experiment to realize that something is definitely happening is near that frequency range, which is enabling the entire system to, to grow and create large architecture. So this is the experimental result. So if you 
if you go at a particular frequency, you will find uh, long. And those are some of the images of the surface. Now, once we get the microtubule and isolated microtubule, not if you look at, if you just Google image of microtubule, then you will find that most of the images that you will see, microtubules are one top of another. All are bundled, bundled, bundled. So those microtubules are no good. No good means if you want to do real characterization, that I will say microtubule has this property. That means that should be considered worldwide as a authentic statement. If you want to do like that, then those images are not good. And it is really, really tough to isolate single microtubules uh, much differ from the, from, the, from the others, say a few micrometers, so that using nanotechnology you can put some probe, reliable probes, and then you can measure what is the exact electronic property of the microtubule. So once we could, could create this electric, electrostatic channel, we are able, we are in a position to study a single microtubule in a very reliable manner. So we, this is the microtubule, that is the AFM image, and we then we put some electric probe, just to measure, just like Ohm's law in the school days we have read, you send voltage, measure current, or send current, measure voltage, the so same, very, very simple, and very basic experiment you will do. One thing I, I should say that uh, I, I showed you that uh, microtubule have inner core water. So those water channels, if they come out, then you will find that microtubule has become, it's not a tube anymore. It is, it is something like the water has sucked out and it is, it is like a dumbbell, dumbbell say, from sideways. So that means your microtubule structure has destroyed. You cannot do work that. So biggest channel challenge, nearly two years back when we, were, we first started the work, was to keep the microtubule in our water intact. But the C term mean is you, can, you saw the polymer -like, like, like chains. If water channel, water goes inside, it's very hard to take out those water. So you need to do, need to suck up, suck out water from the environment in such a way, water comes out from the top part, but not inside the microtubule. So you need a controlled vacuum environment and at the same time, you, you need a pump, pump out moisture. That means you need to put some, say, um, calcium dioxide or calcium oxide or sulfuric acid or uh, bathtub, then layer by layer protection so the moisture comes out and you need, you need to optimize that technology before you go and build this kind of, kind of system. And then we did four probe. So four probe means there will be, there will be uh, four electrodes. Four electrodes is done because um, if you have two electrodes, if you apply voltage and measure current from one single wire, what happens is that in this region there is a contact potential. So when you get the output, you have contact potential inside. But that is not a big problem because billions and billions of electronic devices that you see worldwide all are four probe, uh, all are two probe. So four probe is essential only when you want to measure what is the fundamental property of the microtubule or anywhere or any device. So otherwise, it is not necessary. If you want to do some work, if you want to uh, want to use it for commercial purpose or something, you, you, know, you need not to be worried about this kind of parameters. So four probe we do because we just want to understand because inside the cell, you don't have electrodes or probes. So that is floating condition. So in that floating condition, what should be the property? How should it behave? That's why we use four probe. Okay, so. We want to understand whether there is a quantum effect or not. So if we want to do that, so we need to, we have one electrode E1 and another electrode E2. And suppose we have parallel channels where, say, road through which electron can move. So if we want to understand whether there is a quantum effect or not, there is a very um, established uh, method. You measure the resistance. And the value of resistance will be H by 2 Q square N. Q is the charge. Charge means it could be two electron pair that is moving, or it could be one electron, it could be whole, or it could be uh, a fraction charge, electron by three or electron by four. 
m is number of channels okay now using this formula you have to put and you have to find that uh, near around similar resistance you are getting for this system then you can say that it is uh, it has got some um, quantum effect in the device so how to use this formula suppose um, i have a situation where this is called ballistic transport without any resistance uh, carrier pass suppose i have channel number num four number of channels and electron by four so we multiply and we get 51.6 kilo ohm around if it is five then we replace by five and we get so i have given some of the examples to to have an idea that we can have different kind of channels and different kind of quantized systems and what are the values that we are going to get so if we get around this kind of values consistently then channel is changing and something so this is the this is a very standard and simple way to understand any device i have or any wire or any material any organic or inorganic any kind of material how do we know that quantum effect is going on so okay so then <clears throat> we did some measurement on microtubule and we for we 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 all, not only we measured the dc the current we also applied the different frequency and we found with frequency resistance falls and the particular beyond a particular frequency we will find that resistance has fallen sharply of the of the device and um, you will find current voltage characteristics like this if you change the length if it is a if it is a ballistic regime you know very well if it is a ballistic that means there is no resistance that means how long they are traveling doesn't matter for an example if i want to go from here to there and i and there is no resistance here then doesn't matter i go 1 meter 2 meter 3 meter 4 meter 5 meter so this is a very very simple concept so that means if you are getting ballistic behavior first thing that you should have is that you do length variation study and you find that there is no resistance of course if you go to the higher higher current effect i mean very 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 low current and long distance because of the noise you will find some difference but if you go to the higher i mean low current region then you will you will see that <clears throat> there is no length dependence on that power delivery to the outer circuit the power loss that you have will be minimum minimum near zero i mean of course yeah actually actually we did length variation if you do length variation length does not have any effect so if length does not have any effect then you should get the uh, same kind of power loss so that is also and all length devices are different different devices so with different microtubules so that proves that that what we are talking about is not an artifact of a single device so many different devices they don't know each other they don't have any 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 relations it's just microtubule in it and they behave in a, in a, in a consistent, consistent way. Uh, <clears throat> so, if if we want to want to induce some quantum quantum state, so we we found that uh, around 10 microampere DC current is is uh, sufficient. And um, if we apply large bias, electric bias, you can't do anything. And AC signal of particular frequency region is sufficient. So we know what are the uh, recipe or what are the protocols that we have to go to the quantum state now the most interesting thing of my talk i mean i think i consider this as the very exciting one so temperature independence and temperature independence behavior uh, means you change the temperature no change in conductivity so two probe we have we put the entire sample that we have inside a very um, controlled cryostat system and we change the temperature and we find that there is no change in no change in the resistance values so we take the microtubule to a particular resistance i mean we apply current and we can induce any conducting state and then we go on changing temperature so there is there is a of course of course change but you can see these are quantized changes that means a certain levels and it comes back in in general there are some noises also it could be due to experimental measurement system and other things but in general it maintains the the, the constant conductivity 
So we wanted to understand that it is, is it, is it marketable has, has very unique property and no, no material in the world has, has uh, uh, never, never shown this kind of thing or something. So we found that it is, it is not true actually. Um, if you have a helical potential, then you can have this kind of situation. Helical potential means you are passing through a DNA-like path, like this spiral path, like a spring, this kind of path. So if you if you uh, if you um, uh, know um, a little bit of Hamiltonian and how to solve in the, in the school days, you can you can refer to Kunio Takanagi's paper, and there are several papers where you can find periodic potential flux quantization. If you also Google it, you can find. There is a simple calculation. If you in the in the Hamiltonian, you just put a periodic potential. You will find that the energy level diagram that you, you find does not look like metal semiconductor or insulator. So we know what metal semiconductor insulator look like. You have a conduction band and a valence band. If they touch each other, we know that it is metal. If they are far far apart, then it is an insulator, and they have a gap like 1.52. Uh, three electron volt, then we call them semiconductor. Now, as soon as we come to the helical potential or periodic potential helical um, path, then you will find that there is a point contact gap in the in the band energy diagram. What happens is that if you if you if you pump electron into the system, then it stores at the at the conduction bandage, and they together and the, together all of them are triggered. That makes it coherent. So Kunio Takanagi's science paper is very, very famous. They, what did they do? They took gold nanoware and they made a spiral. And when they went on for, uh, for temperature variation, they found the ballistic transport. That means um, quantum mechanical transport is, was going on in the system. And at the same time, they also found it is independent of temperature. Okay, let's let's visualize how this happened. So this is almost the if you if you are inside microtubule and if you look at the if you are, if you enter inside the energy band diagram, how 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 does it go? So you, so electrons they store in the um, edge and they together pump up. So this is the picture. And one another thing you just you just note that these are discrete energy levels, unlike unlike um, uh, uh, metal or semiconductor or, or others. And the, we have made them transparent, so the bottom, uh, the layer inside, you can see. And if you, if you increase the bias, what happens during simulation, we have also taken into account. That is, there is a fold that is created. So if you pump excess energy, and if you try to disturb the system, the system automatically makes a, makes a small, small up. Just, just point this out, because this is very important for this particular system. When it goes up, what happens is that if you try to disturb the system, in, instead of electron transport occurring through these small point gaps, they also create a parallel two or three gaps around here, contact points. And they shift between the two and maintain the particular energy that has been, particular state that has been encoded into the system. Okay. So, so the temperature variation it cannot see. Now we are set to a point where we can talk about quantum mechanics and quantum state because people, if they hear room temperature quantum, then they get very, very disturbed. Oh, okay, it, how it is possible, especially electronic. Vibronic you can do. For an example, photosynthetic ex, uh, experiments which has been done, those are vibronic current. Vibronic current and electronic current is, is, is completely completely different subject. So in case of vibronic, you have one or few atoms are vib vibrating, and in the same way, another atom is vibrating at another place. But when we talk about electronic coherence, that means you need to send one electron from one place to another without losing energy, without getting disturbed, and without changing the phase. That means it will go in the same state from one point to another. So change, moving a physical object is different than inducing a particular vibration into it. So that's why, that's why um, what we, uh, people, when we, uh, we talk about quantum, 
They are, they are very suspicious if you talk about electronic quantum. And they are very much okay if you talk about vibronic and still there is some coherence and quantum mechanics because they know limit is very, very, very small. Few femtoseconds, few hundreds of femtoseconds, few picoseconds, okay. But it cannot give you a steady state device to perform. Topological qubit. So if we, if we if you know what is bit, what is qubit and topological qubit. Bit we know very well because it is a very popular term and often used. I know in computer how many bits, total number of information created in the year 2008 is 10 to the power 20 bits. In the one year mankind creates uh, information that is more than the information created in the last 5,000 years. So many popular talks are there and everywhere the word bit is used. So bit is basically to physically identi identification fiable objects. That means this chair, this is black and this is red. If, that, if they change color, then we can physically, physically we can observe, we can, we can identify, we can keep this to zero and one. So this is called bit, okay? But if you, if you, if you think of qubit, quantum bit, then at a time you need two states. At a time two states means you have a vacant space basically. That's nothing because, because they superimpose on each other. And there is another term that is topological qubit. Topological qubit means it has some, some feature of a bit along with the quantum essence. That is, it will have a path. It is not like a vacant space that you, in case of qubit, that what is the current state here, you cannot write it down. But in case of topological qubit, you can write it down this path or another path. Either of the this path, it is belonging. So it has it has a, some 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 picturesque associated with it. And uh, this kind of topological qubit concept was proposed first um, 1944, where it was said that instead of logic unit or logic gate or something, we can we can make a shape, a circular shape. And the topological qubit, most interesting thing about topological qubit is that um, suppose a donut uh, and is converted into a cup. So those people who talk about topological qubit, they will say that there is no difference between a donut and a cup. So if you search Google, then you will find majority of the topic on topological qubit, they start with this very particular demonstration. They take the, um, the cup and they distort, distort the, the, the space and uh, they make it look like a donut. And they say, there's no difference. Means if you, if you draw a pattern on the surface, if you twist it in many different ways, uh, still you will be able to keep the essence of the information into it. Maybe I'm going too abstract for you. I understand. So, <laughs> so I will, I will, I will, I will be, I will try to be more clear about it. So now, how microtubule looks like. So you don't need to understand in a very complex way what is there. So this um, particular shape, which looks like um, goggles. So this is that, eight nanometer, two balls together. Okay, we put a lot of balls in a hexagonal close packing. Hexagonal close packing means you have something like this. One, two, three, four, five. Um, six, seven. So it, it is. It is here. So almost in ideal case, it should have a sixty degree angle, but not necessarily always. So if we if we put all these things in such a way, in thirteen different rows, and if we, if we if we roll it, what will happen? Just after thirteen, that number one will come, right? If we just just roll it like this, so you'll find that they are side by side, that is the same. That means you cannot create hexagonal-like thing here. But if you do like this, then if you bring the top one here, you cannot differentiate. If you roll it, it's just the same. So these two type of microtubules are there, but if you go from one end to 13, one by one, one by one, one by one, like following the blue path, then where you end, the next one starts from the bottom, okay? So this is just one period. So six cells, if you, if you want to go from one blue line to another blue line, if you start work, walking, 
then you need to put six steps and you can reach there. So each, each is 80 nanometer in your left, so 6 into 8, 48. But in this case, if you want to go, it is 26 cells, so into 8, 208 nanometer. Or if you are a little conservative, then you can put 25 into 8. Uh, basically, you understand the concept. So when we talk about topological qubit, we are not in a very abstract term. So we can write down the path. So suppose we write zero. We just send a signal of zero at that blue arrow. And we start traveling. Then we reach the end since it is folded. So we start from here again and again. So if I walk on the microtubule, and if we follow the path on the red line, we will continuously, we will feel that we are, we, are, we are moving through a straight line, right? We will always feel that we are moving through a straight line. For an example, on the earth, if we, if we rotate, if we walk around the earth continuously, we will feel that we are on the straight line path, but it is the circle. So that is, then we call it zero, and then one, because if you are standing there, if you are following the minimum energy path, then or minimum uh, energy path, then you have two choices. Either you can go diagonally this direction or this direction. So you can you can also have this direction, and at the end of the path, you can you can you can reach to the same point. You can reach to the same point. That means, classically, to an observer, you started from there, you reach here. There is no difference. But there could be two possible path that is existing simultaneously in between. So it gives you a path with two possibilities. So whenever two possibilities are there, then if we put together, this is not real, right? You can believe that uh, it cannot go to two paths. But it is the probability is existing that it can go through this path. So in quantum mechanical, you can write like this. So we put a 13 here, because if you go from here to here, it is 13. 13 is the distance between them, and the probability of both path together. If you square, add it, and it will be 1. OK. But again, we remember that this is just a quantum mechanical concept. We, we, we Either you have to, classically, any of the two is possible. So when we talk about qubit, we, we say all these three. Now, we try to put. Uh, make different gap and try to create similar kind of thing. So the last thing that we have there, in similar way, this kind of path, we create many at different color and try to put on the microtubule. It's a very simple thing to do. So the blue things were there, and the red one, we, we created new at a gap of 7. At a gap of 5, then we have another choice of green. So we, 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 we we can, in this way, we can construct. But one thing that we should remember that if it is touching, then the, then, then the probability of finding this is just one. So what we do is we neglect the possibility of this kind of situation. So we, we will be happy with the above two. So we keep one restriction. Uh, if we try to put as many as possible, it is good for t-shirt, I think. I don't know all people will like or not. But if you, if you, you can put with a gap of 5, 7, 10, 13, 7, 9, 11, 13, 5, 8, 10, 13, 5, 7, 9, 13. So from here to here, the gap, you just go on putting pumping. But if you put, try to put more, you cannot. You will, you will touch. And if you try to put less, there will be all the possibilities there. So maximum is these four situations. So what is said quantum mechanically is that it is possible that these four possibilities, four qubit, can coexist together. And there is a possibility that they are entangled. So you, they can also coexist classically. It is, it, is, it, is, it is possible. But probably they could also be proved that they are entangled. If, if, it, is, if it could be proved that they are entangled, then it is definitely quantum mechanical entanglement between the qubits. 
So if you if you try to understand the the thing very simply, because it's a very complicated situation, at a gap of two, we can we, if we try to create, we go to the blue and we repeat, we overlap. Not allowed. Gap three, not allowed. Gap four, not allowed. Five, we are very much okay. So we at a gap of five, five, we create. It ends here. It starts here. Never touch. So in this way, you can, with, a, with a piece of paper, we can play with the game, and we can find out what are possible, what are not possible. And then we can, we can find out the possible uh, solutions. One point I would like to say is that uh, at a gap of 5, you create this. At a gap of 5, you create this. When you start here, you will find that these two are at a gap of 3. So 5 decompose into the gap of 5 and 3. So this is simple geometry. So we say 5, gap of 5, 3, 7, gap of 7, 6, 8, gap of 8, 5. So that means you just automatically, you just write it down. You just continue with a piece of uh, paper and pen, and you will find that this kind of situations are arising. It could also be possible that not only you pump from these two directions, you can also pump from these three directions, which could be biologically very, very important. Because if you have a microtubule, and there is the information processing going on from one end to another. But if you can put in between information coherently with the, with the horizontal encoding, then you, you can do some beautiful things. What is that? Is that suppose you have a gap of eight, two information is encoded, two lines you have encoded. Now we have put one line because if we put all the lines, it's, it's not visible. I mean, nothing could be decoded. You want converts into eight into five, and if you put another one, you will find that the gap of 8 is gone. So you, you, you are left with the gap of 3 and 5. Again, if you have a gap of 5, 3, you encode the green one. Another one, you will find the gap of 5 is gone. So 5 limits, 5, 3, 2. Then you put another one, 3, 2. And if you have a gap of 3, 2, you put another one, you will find the gaps are slowly going and they are overlapping each other, so all is gone. So in this way, you can perform some simple perform operations. So <clears throat> we do not explore this possibility. These are just hypotheses from the you know, topological uh, simple calculations that there could be in future. We, can, we, can, we may be able to, able to access this kind of things. Now if you go to the lattice B, the situation is very interesting. Because in case of lattice A, we had, we had a very um, restricted solutions, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13. Now, if you go to the lattice B, what happens? Gap 2, it survives. It is not destroyed. Gap 3, not destroyed. Gap 4, not destroyed. Gap 5, at a gap of 5, you create, you find that it's touching. So not allowed. That means A and B are complementary to each other. And decomposition is not very pronounced. And you can go straight. I showed you Hamiltonian and its solution. And there was a helical path. So if you have a gap x, what should be the helic helicity? So if you think of that particular particular here, if you go through this path, you have a helicity c. But if you go straight, helicity c is infinite. So if you can put that inside the Hamiltonian and you try to solve, you will find that you are always getting coherent system. That means you do not need to induce current. You do not need to induce anything. You will always get the coherent system. So this is one of the very interesting aspect of B. OK, so now if we want to detect, what will happen? Longer we travel, more is the energy required. And smaller length we travel, less is the energy required. So we, if, we, if, we, if for, for some time, for the sake of simplicity, if we consider that we have a, this situation and we want to go to this situation, then we have to release energy and we will come here because smaller number of path. And if you go there, we need to supply excess energy in between. Can we detect something like this? So that means one topological qubit to another topological qubit, we will supply some energy. Just avoid this. So what we do is we measure the resistance and we trigger from inside and we, we try to tweak with the topological qubit that is existing. So we'll try to transfer, supply some energy, and we make sure that any information does not go out and 
influence each other. So you find that at, at a PR of 4 at certain frequencies for particular length of microtubule we always get 4 peaks. For green is particular length of microtubule, red is particular length of microtubule. At a time we get a, we get a pair of 4 and total 7 number of peaks occur if we take different length, different length of microtubule. If you, you will find this is a striking, uh, it has striking similarity with the, with the situation that we also got from the topology. That is at a time we get 4 and we have 7 different choices. So that means we are probably in such a situation where we are really seeing some kind of quantum mechanical effect. And the resistance is also near around the, uh, around 48 or 50 kilometers. So we can say how many number of channels are operating or um, quantum mechanically what is the situation out there. We measure the phase. One of the very interesting thing is that if, if there is a topological qubit, and if you measure phase, then always uh, there should be some uh, quantized phase associated with every single peak. And we measure that for different length, how the phase are occurring. And we put statistically, we find that very particular set of point, we get statistically larger number of peaks, near 0, 45, 90, 135, 180. That means basically four gaps we can create, phase gaps. So electronic charge E by 4. So that means our situation is that our resistance will be, will be around 50K because I showed you the calculation. And phase quantization is also proves that there is some quantum effect. So what we get, we get this kind of frequency range uh, where we see the peaks. Now if you vary the length, we'll see peak for particular length Length is here, 200 nanometer, 400 nanometer, 600 nanometer, and different different lengths. For particular length, we don't see any phase any phase phase, phase effect. Um, what happens in those lengths, we don't know, but we we can provide information that for other lengths, what happens? Which are the peaks you can see? So even if we we forget about everything, forget about what is the quantum effect, what is the um, what are, whether it is quantum or not, what is it entangled or not, if some particular length of microtubule is given to me, I can tell that what should be the phase in which angle and what, what information will pass through and what, what it characterizes. So that is <clears throat> one thing and if you, if, you, if you can do some more calculations, for an example, let us say it is expected that uh, in the cells, you should not get less than 200 nanometer because you can't, you can't get one qubit. So you can, you can, if you try to find out uh, microtubules in the in the cell, it should be minimum length should be around 200 nanometer for for let us say. And uh, another point is that the phase gap, if you see the no phase chain, no phase chain, no phase, you will find three to one, three to one, three to one. It's a period of nearly two micrometer, nearly 2.1 micrometer. And if you, if you make the combination of all these force, you will find that you, can, you get 12. So nearly 24 micrometer you need to create all these combinations. Uh, one interesting thought was that we, we sent a signal from this direction, try to create, and send from that direction. And we found a very typical thing. Near 20 megahertz is behave in a just opposite fashion than the 9 megahertz. So instead of absorbing energy, it releases energy. So it's it just opposite to each other. Why we don't know. And then we did quantum interferometry effect. So quantum interferometry tells us that if you can create some set of qubit here and qubit there. So normally in classical interfer inter interference, you know that if you send a wave and opposite, they will cancel out each other, you get zero. And if they are in the same phase, amplitude will increase. But if it is a quantum uh, device, and if you do the interferometry experiment, both paths simultaneously coexist. So you will never get um, constructive or destructive. You will get flipping between constructive and destructive. So that is considered as the most authentic uh, experimental evidence of uh, topological qubit or any qubit kind of situation. So 
what you do is you send one signal, one send one signal, try to send Q of it, send Q of it, and try to read it here what is going on. And what is going on is there. So you can see that several possibilities are there coexisting. So it is it is not uh, it is not a a static state, it's a dynamic one. Uh, <clears throat> Those who knows about memory, you know about ferroelectric effect or ferroelectric memory. So there are bits. And um, if you go through the textbook, it, it is written in the textbook that this is the ideal square characteristics that you can get. Because if you have a IV characteristics like this, you don't need to supply extra energy to store particular information. And uh, this is a dream graph that you can expect from any electronic electronic device and this is what you get in the output and if you vary the temperature you don't see any changes okay we have measured both electric electric um, quantum and um, classical effect the, the ferroelectric effect together in the system and uh, dynamic instability is the event that i talked at the beginning of this talk that we want to understand if the length fluctuates what is the information content so we want we are now trying to build very authentic table because I, I personally think there is there is some more complex features that we were we are missing so so we are trying to find out the relationship by which it topples now how it topples we know from the result but the relationship we are not able to make out that whether there is any hidden relationship this will occur here or here or here or here that we, we currently we cannot predict but work is going on and definitely we will be able to find out whether they are look this is one set this is another possibility this is another possibility they it could be here it could be here then for a different length you get a different solution right but how they are changing between themselves whether there is any hidden relationship that we are now trying to figure out once we can figure out we can exactly tell give me any length of microtubule and if you send any microampere signal, you are going to get this, 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 this qubit with this, 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 this phase change, and this, 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 this properties. We can exactly tell. So that is the final going. So this is the end of my talk. And uh, so we, we see that microtubule process have classical bit and quantum topological bit. And it is resistivity. It is not, it's not superconducting. It's, it's resistivity we have measured. It is, it is, uh, it's not even a very good metal. It's 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 a good nearly it can go towards a good metal, but temperature independent behavior makes it beautiful. A and B both type of topological uh, both type of microtubules are very essential for the information processing. Just with A or just with B you cannot because you need a very low level transport and the very low level things. So length variation nearly 24 micrometer, 200 nanometer, 24 micrometer is required, and the ferroelectric effect, which tells us that to store information, for an example, you know this in this computer, every millisecond you need to reverse, you need to switch, refresh the bit, otherwise you, you lose it. But if you, if you can use microtubule for, for commercial purpose, say, for, this, for the sake of, then you don't need to refresh it continuously. So this is also effect of Membrister uh, as, as proposed. So finally, I would like to thank Stuart for inviting me here, AORD, US Air Force for funding, JSPS, and Center for Consultant Studies for partial funding. And um, these are the people who are involved, Professor Daisuke Fujita, Dr. Satyajit Sau, who is the postdoctoral fellow with, uh, with me, and um, Dr. Subrata Ghosh, who is also postdoctoral fellow with me, and Dr. Kajuito Hirata, who is the so in work in the superconducting material center, who is the center director, and uh, he has basically 20 or 30 years of experience on superconducting material research. And he, you can say the majority of the research or the measurement that we have done is basically, uh, most of, majority of them has been performed, has been verified in his laboratory. So he has this kind of unique setups. And finally, thank you all of you for your patience and